Okay, everyone, I'm ready. So out there in podcast and YouTube land, we have my uh, good friend, Roman Vasnaya. Okay, now you see you made me trip it up because you made me think about it beforehand. <laughs> Yeah, just one more time. Roman Vaisiano, that's okay. <laughs> that's it, my book. See, I had no, I've known this man for so long, and he was so insistent about his last name before we came on that I tripped myself up. Um, I never was insistent. I would say a word about it. <laughs> Roman is a dear friend of mine. And before we dig into this, uh, as always, everybody, we want to just kind of, you know, as we know that we do this, we have a little bit of moment of silence since we began this journey in the time of COVID. Um, and as we stand now, we've got um, over oh, 571,000 deaths in the United States and uh, almost 3.1 million deaths worldwide. Um, so as always, we'd like to hold a moment of silence for COVID. Also, um, for all of our uh, African-American friends and our First Nation brothers and sisters um, who still continue to lose their lives uh, due to violence and police brutality in this country. Um, these are all things that we are rectifying and getting towards, uh, you know, finding a way out of this. Um, but as for right now, as we know that we like to hold a moment of silence in this space. So if everyone would just join me for uh, 30 seconds, please. Okay, thank you everyone. As you all know out there in the virtual land and those of us listening to us on any type of a podcast, um, that does mean a lot to us. And speaking of that, just before we get into deep, as always, please, if you like what we're doing out there content wise, um, always subscribe and hit the like button. This just, just helps us to reach more people and uh, you know increase our engagement, which just kind of you know helps more people listen into what we have going on. So as I started out by saying, Roman and I go uh, way back and he's a dear friend of mine. And for those of you who don't know Roman, um, Roman started his uh, career in, uh, in, in Russia and was able to make his way as a cinematographer here to the United States. And I know we have a lot of uh, listeners out there who come to us from many different countries. And this is always an interesting thought about how do people make it and then transition uh, to America. Uh, so Roman, first of all, thank you for being here. I want to of give you a little love. Anytime. <laughs> dear, old, you. <laughs> dear, dear friend, dear friend, Roman and I have done a couple of projects together and we're keep searching to do more. So Roman, why don't you tell us just about, you know, your particular journey, um, how you started, decided to become a cinematographer and how you came to be, you know, here in the United States. Well, my daddy was a photographer when I was growing up. And I was kind of was next to him. And uh, uh, after it sort of a time came to decide whom I want to be, uh, I actually have no idea about filmmaking or cinematography at all. But luckily, our neighbor in the house in the apartment building where I was living with my family, he was a cinematographer. And he saw some of my photos I took with my dad just by accident, not by accident, but just I never really also was considering photography like deeply. I just was helping my dad be in a red bathroom and develop film and you know all this kind of sweet old style stuff it was kind of our father and son time most of times so where so that's why i kind of always liked it uh, uh if i'm analyzing it now and basically he just advised me the neighbor advised me to go to that uh, film school moscow film school we have uh, in right now in Russia in Moscow we have multiple film schools, but but in 1998 when I um, try to pass exams there uh, basically there was only one film school since Soviet Union and uh, where Tarkovsky studied basically all be every big filmmaker in Soviet Union was kind of in that film school so it has a very long time tradition it's a five year education uh, probably right now if you put their American students say like I don't understand why we need to like learn philosophy, history of art, uh, try to paint, la, 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 la. But actually, I the more I think about it, the more I understand how incredible, what kind of incredible education I got out there. And uh, well, actually free, <laughs> because it's a free education in, in Russia. Uh, uh, so I started basically taking photos to be in competition for exam. It's like, was like, you have to also pass like chemistry, all kinds of exams there. and. Um, 
I didn't, I didn't pass first time. And then I worked entire year, kind of took more stills, work harder. And then the second time I passed the exams, I get on the film school. And I was really lucky because uh, my teacher in the film school was a, a cinematographer who worked with Andrei Tarkovsky and shot with him Solaris, Andrei Rublev, uh, Childhood of Ivan, um, uh, and the, his first uh, short feature, which they did together in the film school. And by having a sort of a master like that, uh, it's immediately kind of put you in the top, top, top uh, of the world in terms of the knowledge, in terms of the um, sort of a, the f- feedback you're getting from him, sort of your, your, your wish to do your best to show him your work. Uh, so all five years was pr- truly like a joinable journey. And um, we watched a lot of movies like, you know, about, the classics of uh, history of cinema and uh, with his comments watch his movies and he to- taught us a lot how he worked with Tarkovsky and what was his approach so it's been a, a, an extremely creative amazing lab and uh, I didn't speak English before I uh, uh, passed exams to my film school and then I start uh, seeing the American cinematographers issues uh, in our department, cinematography department. And I really wanted to, to read them and I, I didn't speak English. So I tried to kind of read them just with a dictionary. And then basically I found a teacher <laughs> who was uh, teaching English uh, in my institute uh, to actors. Uh, so they can play Shakespeare plays uh, and sort of travel with that. And uh, he, he loved Beatles a lot. So we were singing <laughs> a lot of Beatles songs and stuff like that. So it was quite a, quite a interesting. And actually the most cool thing about him that he, he, he was trained in Soviet Union in like the most amazing, uh, <laughs> like kind of closed uh, university of foreign languages to be a spy. So if you look at him, he looks like not Russian. He looks like he likes uh, some sort of a dude who can live like in, uh, I don't know, in like L- London or something. But because he had a problem with alcohol, he never really passed that test. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So I was basically visiting dorm where he was living because he was completely uh, kind of had no money or anything. So he was living in a dormitory with students. So I worked and I study every time before work. I went to him one one hour of English and then straight to classes. So it's like that. And I start translating American cinematography, fair uh, magazine and. Um, Little by little, I mean, not little by little, I, I definitely always felt that I want to be part of that uh, industry and Hollywood, not in terms of, uh, uh, you know, I loved like Hollywood movies, but it just in terms I was fascinated by equipment, craft, like all, all these possibilities, which we didn't really have in Russia. Right now, I'm kind of on the other side of a specter where you understand actually you don't need all those. <laughs> what you need is a meaningful script and one camera. But uh, but uh, on those days, it was extremely, it was like a Toys R Us kind of experience when you look at those pictures and you see those big trailers, big cranes. And uh, in our film school, we still had a Soviet camera and Soviet uh, black and white film with like mosquitoes in emulsion, which you have to develop and you have to pick your own like, you know, time for development so you can see at least something. So <laughs> that was a film school. And uh, when I graduated a film school, uh, basically the 90s in, in Russia was pretty tough. It was that kind of uh, changing process from Soviet Union to sort of democratic government, but was basically uh, uh, it, the production started coming more and more, it was producing more and more films, more and more demand from TV. Uh, so I shot my first feature film right after I graduated from Institute, not because I was so talented, even I won my Kodak prize for best student cinematography work, uh, but because uh, it, w- it was like the old generation people like who work in the Soviet Union system, they didn't know how to work with new time and work fast and everything because Tarkovsky was shooting his movies for two years or three years sometimes, shoot movie and reshoot movie like Stalker. So, <laughs> so basically I shot my first feature film when I was 22 and after that I pretty much didn't stop. And I was shooting commercials, shooting everything, but uh, I always dreamed to come to States. And uh, in 2010, two things came together. I shot a pretty good uh, commercial for Philips with Carl Eric Rinch. Uh, I think I believe it was M- MGZ. Uh, so it's won a lot of prizes in commercial cons, like film crafts, cinematography, everything. And in the same time, I did a musical, Hipsters, in Russia uh, about uh, 
like hipsters in 1950s in Soviet Union, uh, which been screened in Toronto Film Festival and had a pretty good uh, festival run. And uh, one day, just in the middle of the night, my cell phone ring and uh, my agent, with whom I still, Pete Francesco, called me and said, hey, uh, I just got those two jobs, the commercial and the movie. I thought it's two different people, but now I realize it's you. And we thought you were like 60 years old, man. And I was like 22, 24. 20, no, I'm lying, I was 27, 20, 28. So basically there's like, oh, we really like your work. Do you want to try to work in the States and stuff? And I, I immediately realized that it's a, a possibility of kind of the dream come true in a way for me. And uh, I said, yeah, absolutely, whatever it takes. I'm ready to work for free. So whatever, <laughs> whatever it takes. And I, I jumped on the plane and flew with a tourist visa, meet the agent and uh, we start from there. And after maybe like four or five months, I got a first feature, uh, Motel Life, uh, with Polsky Brothers. It's a little drama we did in Nevada. It was my first US experience. I learned a lot, not just as a, uh, it wasn't that difficult in terms of uh, shooting craft, but it was kind of the whole, the whole entire time I have to speak English, I have to express myself in English. And I was operating camera as well at that time. So I was to talk with actors and don't confuse them, which is sometimes very difficult if you're on the night days and you have to speak English when you don't really speak English. So, so it's a lot of confusion. But at the same time, I think I did a pretty good job. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the movie didn't become like a great hit, but it was a good movie. I think it won even like Best Director in Rome Film Festival or something, which was like amazing. And after that, uh, my agent sent me the script. It called uh, End the Watch. I read the script and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting, all these small cameras and everything. And uh, he said, okay, director wants to meet you. And I jumped on the car and drove to Los Feliz and I, I met David Ayer. He was sitting there, basically his first line said, dude, like I, I cannot write anymore as a writer. I'm fucking sick of it. We got to shoot this movie. We got to make it amazing. I said, yeah, let's do it amazing. So, so, and this is how basically God end the watch. Uh, which kind of was my ticket to bigger movies and further collaboration with David. And this also started. And uh, by shooting in the watch, I kind of moved to LA because I realized that pretty much if I want to do something further with my career, I want to be connected more with, with the United States and, and work in America and try to you know, do my best. And this is also started. That's amazing. And a lot of people don't even realize it. it's interesting when you talk about the desire to learn English for, you know, like even obviously learning your trade and your craft, but realizing you, those communication skills, you know, whether it was an obvious thing to you at the time or something you understood subconsciously, like you needed that as a tool to be able to, if you're going to break through and be able to work with American filmmakers, you know, um, Absolutely. Yeah, and that is an amazing, yeah, that, that is an amazing, you know, story. So it wasn't really until end of the watch that you moved here to the States, right? Is that, that that's what you're saying? Yeah, right? it was that's basically true. like nine years ago. Right, right now I'm living in the States uh, nine years total. So uh, yeah, that was only the time because I never really had like that movie uh, in my career, which kind of like everyone talks about that European hit or something where you got immediately calls so I have to kind of make it through my own way through little by little. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, everyone has own destiny. Sometimes people get great movie, first great movie, and everyone wants to work with them. Uh, sometimes you just have to kind of work through and shoot as many as you can and find that great movie. So <clears throat> so I, I think uh, kind of my life, it's kind of always kind of second path. I kind of work really hard and try to do what I can, my best with everything. and then. Sometimes it works, uh, sometimes it doesn't, but uh, I feel I learned so much from every process that anyway, I think by uh, right now, the ultimate goal, try to be as, as, as best filmmaker as you only can. And of course, cinematographer, but I think more importantly, filmmaker. So, so you, you can help director to do uh, his best work. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's obviously, you know, we always talk about, here at the film roundtable is, you know, the team effort that it, it becomes into telling a story that it's not something that's just on one person's shoulders. And clearly the relationship with the cinematographer and the, and the director is such an intertwined, you know, piece of that storytelling, you know? And, um, you know, the one thing I think is very interesting. I mean, you know, for those that don't fully know your career I can just say, you know, obviously that was the first project you did with David Ayer. Then you did Fury with him 
as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from Fury, you did, uh, you know, got Suicide into squad. the, what's Suicide. that? Suicide Squad we did then in Toronto, yeah. That's right. So Suicide Squad, you got into the DC universe. And then uh, from there, you did Bright with him. So these are, as you were talking about before, as you escalate into yes. bigger and bigger projects. And, yeah. you know, I mean, one thing I do know about you is you have, um, you have consciously within recently tried to get back into some of the smaller stories, the more emotional heart storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit of something about that and where that journey has taken you. Well, I, I actually, after finishing um, Triple Frontier with Jesse Chandler in Netflix, it was a big, big movie and uh, was a kind of like almost two years of my life because the movie was up and down several times. And finally, we made it uh, for Netflix. Uh, originally, it should be a Paramount movie. I just realized that kind of I want to go back and start sort of a, not like from a scratch or something, just, just do what I what I kind of like to do, what kind of movies actually inspire me to be a DP and what kind of movies I reacting more soulfully to, you know? And uh, I did a movie with a friend of mine, director uh, called Adessa. Uh, it should be on some net Netflix soon, but people can check out my website and, and see the trailer. So that was an amazing experience. It's a, it's a little story uh, about, um, uh, you know, a 40 years old man who falls in love with a, you know, 16 years old girl. And it's of course illegal during the Soviet time and there is nothing bad happening, but he just feels in love. And uh, it's a very personal story. And uh, we shot it on film in several regions of Russia and uh, everything was like one camera. We had 45 days and uh, we wait for great light. Uh, it was like, the, the, you know, a pure pleasure. Uh, after that movie, I, I was like, I can shoot another movie just literally in a week. I wasn't even tired. It was uh, just so like such a creative experience. So right now I just try to kind of, uh, uh, I'm 40 years old. So I try to just be me, not, not picky, but just try to basically wait for projects I'm really connecting to. Either shoot it with people I love and want to work with or just wait for something I'm super inspired, you know? Because I also think that um, uh, I think right now only really few directors in Hollywood can really do uh, great movies. Uh, just because in these days, if like I don't know, twenty years ago, you could have done one great movie and you immediately have opportunity to shoot another movie you want. These days, I think it's not enough even to the people who read your script that you just did a good movie. You know, you have to shoot like five great movies. All those five great movies has to be have to be uh, Oscar nominated, win some Palme d'Or, and then people are like, okay, maybe we're gonna give him thirty days and he can shoot his little drama about father and son. So I think the times that really has changed tremendously, not in a good way. I I personally think not because I like old things or something. It's just because I think. Yes, uh, all the serious drama is on television right now, but at the same time, what's going on with the movie theaters and filmmaking at his best. And my dream was to come to America because, you know, I love, of course, like Scorsese movies, Coppola movies, uh, all the 70s movies. Uh, and right now I think it's kind of, it's very tough to make them here. So I actually think that European uh, Europe right now is a place to do movies, is way more welcoming for, uh, uh, strong directors with strong stories. Uh, yes, you're not going to have all the toys. Yes, you're not going to have, uh, you know, this Hollywood production, but you will have creative freedom, which is, I think, is right now super jeopardized in, in the United States by, by studio, by a lot of people get involved. And uh, I think it's, it's really a, a total mistake because it's actually very interesting. Sometimes people, yeah, there are scripts when you read, you know, it's going to be a great movie, even, even if not a great director going to direct it because the script is so good. But in the majority of times, there is a story where people can sort of like say, hmm, I'm not sure if this is great or something, but director as a, as a person, as a human being, as an artist can make something amazing with that, you know? So it doesn't, what I'm saying, like it's not necessary reads on the pages. Sometimes you can read the script, say so, whatever. But then later on, it's a it's a great movie because you know you don't know what this guy is thinking of. You don't know what what his 
rhythm of the telling the story and so on. And I, unfortunately, I think these type of filmmakers don't really have chance right now, like to do something because they cannot deliver script where it's like first three pages action scene, then it's a beat, then it's this, then it's that. And, and, uh, and you know, it's all kind of like calculated thing. You know, I'm sure if you, if someone right now will read like Apocalypse Now, a script, it will be probably 240 pages you can barely go through, you know, but it's a, a masterpiece. So, so, so that's the today's reality, unfortunately. And, and so, you're absolutely right. There's so many of those great movies that we look at that are like, we consider like masterpieces that there is no way they would get made in the system these days. No, no, not even just like you literally some dude from studio who had like uh, three classes of film school will tell you what's wrong with your script. Yeah. So, so it's not even like we don't, we don't, they not even tell you like, this is great, but we think maybe you should change something. No, they'll be like, dude, this is shit. And you literally like, you know, did a, like, for example, I really like work of this. I forgot his name. Forgive me for that. This director who did um, Tangerine. Oh, and, yes. And his next movie was uh, Florida uh, Project, right? Was Florida that Project. I think it's a, it's a, it's a definitely a new American, uh, you know, kind of director star in the way of movies I love. But if you look, what is he doing? He probably another like three, three years and I'm trying to lift off the ground some, some of his next project, you know? And I think that's wrong. And I think, I think what is wrong, like in Russia was all sort of a uh, ugliness of a political situation there is a still a government fund where, for example, producers can come and get 30% uh, finance for their movie so that it can go to TV, that it can go to other people and find another 70. And I think that such country as America with such a huge economy don't have a, a, a true public fund uh, to finance movies as art form, not as, a, not as a tool to make more money but as an art form is, is purely unacceptable because this kind of funds, they are in Poland, in France, in Spain, in Italy, and all, all, all over the world pretty much, except some, and, you know, and here, it, it, because uh, you, you can't shoot the amazing movie if you have a producer who only has to make this money back to pay like all this, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's so much pressure that, that there is never something extremely extraordinary can come out because there's so much fear. No, that's a that's a great point. And it's, you know, American considers itself to be the, you know, the, the center of the filmmaking universe, but yet it's like we we tie the hands of artists here, you know, because we, we don't allow them. And it, it becomes so much about money that it's hard just to create cinema as an art form and really, you know, survive well as a filmmaker, unless you're really trying to get you know, the budget or the paydays that are needed so that you can, you know, survive. I mean, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, speaking of the film funds, I mean, because I, you know, one thing I do know, and, you know, you can talk about it more and explain uh -huh. when mm -hmm. and how these things are going to happen. But when you went back to Russia recently, you directed a movie. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that, how that came about? Well, it was also sort of a total uh, magical kind of thing. Uh, I bought rights to a book of a very famous uh, Russian writer about uh, 10 years ago. And it basically was his first um, uh, novel about the dorm, about kids who lives in dormitory in 1984. And uh, basically it's kind of grew up story, but a little tougher. Uh, and uh, I was fascinated as cinematographer, first of all, try to find a director for this project because the whole story takes place in one building in, in dorm and it's like five actors and people running between the rooms uh, trying to figure out their lives but at the same time if you look at it from the from kind of more above you understand that it's a whole picture of a human life with all you know the passions the it's like Shakespeare basically or Dostoevsky in the in the in the in the building and I was very kind of fascinated by this story. So I bought rights. And then on the triple frontier where I had a couple of shutdowns, <laughs> after second shutdown, we were prepping movie in Hawaii to shoot. And suddenly they said, okay, we pull the plug. And I already paid my rent for the place uh, and everything. So I was like, okay, I just stay here and try to write the script just out of curiosity. And I sat down and wrote a script myself based on the book. So it's not like original idea, but I was just very interested to kind of go through it because 
sometimes as a cinematographer you receive scripts yeah you, you like greg frazier what we talk about you say okay I, tr I always try to read it first not as a dp just as the audience and then second time i read it as a dp uh, i also try to do that my issue sometimes that because english is not my first language sometimes if you read like a full-on drama which is something i would love to do in russia because i understand the depthness of the story here without the background and growing up here and uh, understanding the whole culture and generally it's hard to make a decision or it's even hard sometimes to read you don't you don't get you don't get emotionally attached to that so much but if you reread it a couple times and so basically i need like twice more time to get in through a script you know and uh, <clears throat> was that was it just interesting to see how it goes and i had time so i wrote a script and then i sent it to my friend producer in russia i said hey what do you think i just wrote out curiously who can direct it so i can be dp <clears throat> for this project and he's like well okay yeah and then i call him in the week and he's like oh we send your script to this government uh fund where there is like once a year to do presentation and it's a competition and depict the script which has will, which will get majority of money and then the the sort of a in the line like whoever is a little worse they get less money so basically and like I said, and I kind of forgot about the story because the shooting, the movie <clears throat> came back and <clears throat> I have to basically focusing on my work and working with amazing, my friend of mine and amazing director, JC Chandler. And then <laughs> he, <clears throat> he called me back like in a couple of months, I was like, oh, we won the first prize. So we have to shoot the movie. I was like, what do you mean we won the first prize? He's like, we just got the, all the money for the movie. So who do you want it to direct it? And like, and, and the issue is those money, when you get them, you have to spend them. So what you cannot do, you, you cannot get them and then say no, because then, then the producers got penalties and it can be a big issue. <laughs> and I said, well, what about that director I want to work with? What about that director? What about that director? And then like we pick, no one was available. <laughs> Some people were, didn't like the story. And uh, so basically it was about like a two months, eight weeks where he called me and said listen man i'm in trouble i have to receive those money it means like i cannot be in that competition for fun for another two years they basically exclude his company because if you took the money and don't spend them they exclude you for two years and then only you can come back and for him in russia it's like a main first money where people start kind of okay we have this amount of money we have the stars we need just this so we can go so it's huge and i kind of like so what i supposed to do is that maybe you should do it yourself i was like okay so and i really was hoping every day that it's never going to happen because i really want to do it just because i'm a gp i don't want to be direct at all never dreamed about i mean i swear to god i can go like put a candle in the church never never had a, even i said it's a crazy work who wants to be director but kind of i was in the circumstance of my own potential <laughs> ideas to be good or just i don't know some craziness basically and um this is it. Like I, I, I shot commercial and I, I flew to St. Petersburg where we find a place, the dormitory where we're supposed to shoot the movie. I started casting and like, it, it was crazy. I mean, it was 22 days shoot. And uh, what was amazing for me that all my life when I worked with directors, I, I knew like where to put a camera and how to block scene. It was so clear. But first thing on set, I remember when the first day, I have no idea where to put a camera. I have no idea <laughs> what all these people are going to do. It's like someone just cut the plug in my head, which been like all my life about framing and blocking and all this stuff. And literally, I just have this like four wild actors in the first scene when the guy is waking up and running around room and I have no idea how to shoot it. And, <laughs> and basically, I realized that, I mean, I think the biggest sort of mistake that a lot of DPs who does who do transition uh, from being DP to director, they think that, oh, what's the point? Like, I know how to block all this. I know where to put the camera. But actually, it's such a different jobs. It's insane. It's literally have nothing to do in common except just a frame. But like, it's director, it's about basically lighting with emotions. So you have your characters and that's the most important part. Nothing else is matter. The way it's shot, I mean, I'm sorry. I know it's a DP's podcast, but reality is like, if you, if you talk about like <laughs> a movie, a good movie, it, what it's all about, it's about your character in front of the camera who's changing and the story who's changing. And you think what the, 
what emotion the audience should feel at this moment. And basically all your intention about the shots and everything is about that emotion. And um, that's it. So I had this crazy, right? We shot the movie. Um, I then I flew for like a vacation for a couple weeks because I had no idea what I'm done. <laughs> well, I mean, I, of course I was prepared. I did storyboard, I did everything. But to be honest with you, as I said, you have, when you're on set, you have no idea what's <laughs> happening. The, your, your adrenaline is like <clears throat> 55 all, like it's just crazy. And in what, what is, you literally feel you, like hopeless. Like you feel you just have to somehow go through the day and do something where you can. And then we did a first cut of the movie and uh, I showed to a couple of people and everyone was kind of blown away by the, by the movie itself. And uh, they didn't expect from me because I remember I met uh, another producer, uh, also a good friend of mine. Um, and he's like, oh, I heard you directing. And I said, yeah, it's like, I, I told him it's total accident. <laughs> like I did. He's like, don't worry, man. You always can come back to shooting. It's okay. So he immediately told me that basically I have zero chances <laughs> to do anything good. <laughs> so I just better not even start. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, well, I think I did very the opposite. And, um, and sort of, uh, we finished the movie. We, we got accepted by Berlin Film Festival. And then producer said like, no, we don't want to go to Berlin. Let's try for Cannes. And it was basically uh, February 2020. And on February 29th of March, <laughs> first week of March, we knew all that happened. So basically we kind of lost our opportunity to be on a big film festival. And it was after that, it was just a nightmare. Like uh, Ken took us to short list for Fortnite. Then they were holding, then Ken was delayed. Then it was like either label or you go next year. They said, let's go next year. And right now, is that going to happen? No one knows. So basically, <laughs> right now, they uh, Sony bought us uh, uh, and uh, they're going to release a movie anyway in autumn in Russia. Uh, I don't know about it's uh, international. We have pretty good uh, international sales company who does uh, Pavel Pavlikovsky movies like Cold War. And they've been had a movie, Polish movie nominated for Best Foreign Picture a couple of years ago. It's great guys. Uh, but I don't know like what, what will be, it, it, it's like one of those things where it's not enough just to shoot a good movie it's like <laughs> it's this movie has to be on topics where people care this moment and like it's just so much stuff involved so so the only if you kind of sort of uh, uh, put a line under what i was just saying so after that experience every time when i see director i want to like make a sandwich for him or, or sort of a tell him but i really love you man like i don't know just because reality is it's it's probably the hardest job on the planet earth and sometimes being a dp you kind of forgot those things you think like oh it's so easy like just let's just shoot it it's go it's great it's great she comes out but you don't know how much that guy going through like in psychologically because he analyzing what they feel what the actors feel what their motivation and i was lucky i was had i was blessed with great actors and we were very shorthanded and and we're very close as friends but i can imagine if your actor doesn't want to talk to you doesn't want to be involved or has a different opinion the stress level you have is basically unbelievable and uh, you can literally go to like uh you know a mental institution after the movie easy and, and i think uh you know it's like if you're talking about you know if it's not like some big action movie. I never shot a big mansion, but if you do a drama, it's basically you you open up all your thoughts, <clears throat> all your opinions, all all your perception of life to people. You show them, and they might say, "Dude, you just stupid. What do you have inside of you? It's like doesn't make any sense." <laughs> and they can be over, you know. So so it's 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 crazy. It's really crazy experience. But I think it definitely made me way stronger filmmaker. I definitely enjoying cinematography right now like as a kind of restart recharge in terms of the kind of i don't want to spend any more time with my framing with uh, proposing to director things which i know never going to be used in the edit or doesn't make sense in the edit because the the, the time is crucial and and on set and uh, the most crucial time is your director with actor because uh, if you don't have the energy from that guy the actor it doesn't matter how it looks it can be the most beautiful picture in the world no one cares no one gonna feel a thing so <clears throat> that's i think that's that's what i learned you know well yeah. that's an amazing that is an amazing uh you know learning experience and i can attest because roman has allowed me to see this movie that it is a beautiful picture 
So if anyone does get the opportunity, you know, uh, yeah, after a release, it'll be probably on iTunes and uh, on Netflix. We'll see. Yeah, no, but it's it's a beautiful picture, and I think as you said, Dostoevsky in a dorm is a perfect is a perfect summation of what it is, and it it really is amazing. I mean, as you've said, what you learned from that, and what you are able to bring in and now as a cinematographer to help directors, um, you know, is a very powerful statement because you know even though they're both such creative arms that try and work together to get a project done. You know, a, a lot of times, clearly, the cinematographers are pushing the envelope for something which is about the visual, you know, but that the question is, does that visual maintain the idea of what character or emotion is, right? And now with what you've gone through, you're saying is that you lean now, you're like thinking character, emotion, and then bringing a visual that backs that up versus thinking about the visual first. Is that, is well, that, is that true? Absolutely. And, the, and actually, the craziest thing that actually the most amazing visual will never make the edit that's what's insane it just never does because it's so beautiful it kind of drugs people from the story and they want to be into the story and uh every everything what pops up either it's like entire style of the movie entire language of the movie where everything is shy it's like musical or something then it's okay but if you're telling uh if we're talking about pure drama it has to be and i i i i was thinking that yes, filmmaking, it's a collaboration and everyone kind of makes movie with director, but I, I still think it's kind of probably the most expensive form of personal art in the world. <laughs> I think reality is like the only one guy is making the movie because uh, 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 you can help, you can do your best, you can be his right hand, left hand, whatever. But if he doesn't have behind him something, what he wants to tell, if he doesn't see the whole thing in general, you can put then 25 editors on it, whatever. It will never be that top, top level. It will be good, great, maybe good, but but never going to be amazing. Because amazing, I think it only comes from very personal things, very personal experiences, personal relationship with the material, uh, passionate relationship with the material. And then it all comes together. And I think saying that in coming back to cinematography, I know like my fellow DPs probably will put me in a blacklist for the end of their lives but I, I actually found that in a couple like three four years i think quaron and paul thomas anderson in terms of cinematography there are two movies they dp themselves it was outstanding work in my opinion just because it will kind of be you know not everyone can do that of course but i i, I still feel because they definitely spend time on things which are going to be good for the movie and they're amazing dps like matthew labyrinth or you know hoyt or greg frazier who know who can be that you know who knows exactly how to fill in story and some people sometimes have difficulties with uh, finding helping director find a good cinema language like what's the language what what are you using what lenses you're using what what is this language because the look of the movie is 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 the atmosphere it helps so and sometimes when director isn't visual, right? He comes from different backgrounds, acting or something. I think that's where it's extremely important and, and truly becomes a partner with, with a director in creating that world, you know? And that's why I think uh, no one should really, if DP's looking that should consider themselves as just like, or, you know, I'm a good lighter, I'm a good, no, 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 no. You have to be a filmmaker. You have to understand what the story is about. What what are you what are you saying? What what are you helping to say? What is that lens? And I think that's like the most hardest, trickiest part you 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 learn all your life. Yeah, no, that I mean, and that's well said. You know, it's 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 interesting. You know, coming from a, a cinematographer such as yourself, you 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 realize that you learn some incredible lessons. You know, being forced to direct a picture. You yes. know? And then, and now, it, you know, I mean, everything we do, right, it's all about tools that make us better at whatever our craft is, you know, and in a certain way, you know, as you said, it took you directing a movie to make you a better cinematographer. That's a very interesting journey, don't you think? Well, I definitely think so. Right now, I just feel like I kind of seen a lot and I I'm just want to work with great people and do my best for them and uh, enjoy my life. Like kind of this kind of experience just because like whatever you go with directing, like I have no idea how those people live their lives. It's, it's insanity, like seriously. And uh, what's crazy is even your body kind of 
has started having di different uh, uh, diseases. Like if you DP, you have like a, you know, you have a pain in the back, you have a shoulder pain. If you director, you stop sleeping, first of all. Then, then, then you have like migraines, then you have like panic attacks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you literally become like a, a full, you, basically your doctor is completely changed. Like you don't go MRI, you go to psychiatry. So, <laughs> so I personally think it's a hell of a journey. And yes, you are very happy because this process of creating something, what was were in your mind for such a long time, it becomes real. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a drug. I understand why people will start directing; they cannot stop. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know. I feel like I've done it, and like that was amazing. <laughs> so we'll see what's next. <laughs> like I, I, I don't feel like it's the experience you have to repeat it too often. It's too too difficult. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. And it's also interesting, I mean, the whole way that it came about for you, right? Actually, you know, winning this grant so that you're then, you know, oh, okay, you know, I own the rights to this. I'm going to shoot this. Oh, well, there's no one wants to direct it. Now I have to direct it. Yeah, it's exactly. part of your, your nature. You're very easygoing and accepting all of the challenges at hand, you know? <laughs> well, you kind of have to, otherwise you just let people down. I, I hate like, you know, when you, people work for you, try to do your best, and then suddenly you're like, oh, no, I don't think it's a great idea. <laughs> like, All right, so we have to do it then. <laughs> Shit. So, but thanks to my agents, you know, and Pete and Robert were very like, it says like, man, good luck, of course. <laughs> like they were, they were, I thought they were like, Rome, what are you doing? Like, it's dangerous. You might never, like, they were like, dude, of course, do it. It's amazing. And uh, I show movie to my to my agent and John Killick and, um, and, you know, I was very like sort of touched by their reaction. So I, because I think they either didn't, didn't have any high expectations. So, so it was kind of good. <laughs> in the end. Well, that's, that's always the beauty of it, right? If people don't have the bar set so high, it's like, you're not going to, they're going to be like impressed out of the gate, no matter what, you know, but, yeah, but yeah, that's but not a fair assumption to say, because clearly you've done a beautiful piece. So I think it's just, you know, regardless, I don't think people would see it and need to know who the background of the director, but it is a beautiful piece of storytelling. And, um, and, and, you know, the interesting thing is, I mean, in, as we've said, you know, your journey, you know, here to the States and everyone's story is always so different, right? There is no, oh, if you do this, this will happen, then that, then the other. Everything you've just talked about is just proof of that, right? You have had your own journey to get where you are which is only Roman's journey. No one else can talk about using those steps to get there. But what would you offer as advice to young filmmakers overseas who want to become storytellers or filmmakers in America? Well, definitely, uh, definitely language. I mean, it's, it's super important to communicate. And, and, and second, I think it, 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 as a DPs, if you got proposal for, let's say, make a commercial hit in your own country, like it can be like, I don't know, a uh, superhero movie of your country. I don't know, but you have to understand that if you wanna be uh, basically scouted, that's a good word probably by agents or get proposal from states, you really have to focusing on a, on a very personal uh, little uh, drama films which have potential to be screened on film festival around the world and, and be noticed. Because with commercial projects, yeah, you will flex your muscles in a good way. You learn a lot of things. You will know how to you know, move to set and blah, blah, blah. But very rarely those movies became uh, international hits. They do, but very rarely, not every year, not every two years. So it has to be really a, a serious work like Luc Bisson or something like a level of uh, huge level. The other way, festivals and people like, for example, I don't know that guy personally, but uh, we have some friends in common. Arseny Kuchuterian, he's an Armenian cinematographer, and he did with a Georgian friend of his a movie Beginning. And uh, it's won all San Sebastian Awards last year. It's I saw it was on the Mobi, Mobi uh, platform, the movie, very interesting movie, very like mix of... Um, Tarkovsky, Abuladze, like interesting Soviet filmmakers. And um, right now he's, he might, he, I, I heard uh, that he might gonna do a movie with a um, uh, director who did Call Me By Your Name uh, because he was a president of jury in San Sebastian and saw the movie. So <clears throat> what I'm saying is like, sometimes those small movies, they're not gonna pay your bills. It will be super difficult. 
it's a painful experience uh, because none of them go into festivals and 80%, 90% will be very pretentious shit, which will be like, dude, this is just horrible. But if one of them at least make it out there, you have a really big chance to be, no to be, to be noticed and uh, get a chance. So I think focus on that side of a filmmaking. I think like very uh, tr true filmmaking, not a, not, a, not a commercial filmmaking as a job, right? E even though I liked their part at first because I was very intrigued by my craft and learning the craft and saying cinematography as a craft because those big movies, what is also unfair, it's never participate or people cannot win, you know, award for superhero movie. I mean, Wally Fister did for Batman, but still very rarely, right? But actually what uh, only professionals know, not the critics, not the audience, that how much work it is actually for DP. And it's like super hard work to keep on track on everything and, you know, do that stuff. The other thing is just when you shoot a small movie, you have no place to hide. You have to, you have to just lens an actor in the wall. So you, this is it. This is who you are. And if you do a good job there, then definitely it means you can think in the right way. So, and after that, if they give you budget and money, you probably will make it. Some people don't make it as well. There's no like right or wrong, or this is works, this is doesn't. It's always, like you said, very different. But the advice will be, Focusing on the real filmmaking and, you know, watch as many great, great movies as possible, because I, especially I feel like these days, <clears throat> just a general level, especially after uh, COVID, I think also what I see, what kind of scripts is greenlit right now in Hollywood. And it's basically everyone is so afraid not to make money now because everyone needs money because it's been two years without cinema, two years without. So basically... <laughs> right now even a bad movie becomes okay because not enough good movies around and what is green lit will be only for purpose how they how studio executives sort of a uh, dream of what's the hit money movie should look like <laughs> so be be ready with a lot of shit on the movie theaters like uh, screening so it's even important for young filmmakers to look back and and see Michelangelo Antignoni, see, you know, all these great, great filmmakers, you know, and understand what really cinema is. Because what we see today, very few directors, and I, I admire and big, big fan of James Gray and Dagi, worked with him so many times, and they're friends and collaborators. And I think, like, I think those people don't get um, sort of a really the anticipa anticipation they deserve, the, the, what they've done for, for cinema, what they think, you know, because just the world has changed. And unfortunately, people who make decisions, like we said, they're not getting smarter. And, you know, that's, that's the today's reality. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard because, you know, so much of it, as, you, as you've said eloquently, is trying to just push the commercial side of things, you know. So, but even, as you said, it's like people who are, you know, pretend, you know, commercial Ha directors or or p or even studio executives that have commercial um aspirations you know are always looking for that next very talented artist you know international whether it be a director or a cinematographer it's always very interesting you know how the people who become the hot thing that the studio executives are talking about because they're hoping that you know they're, they're hoping to unearth the next you know you, you know a genius artistic genius that somehow is going to take something that's not so great and make it excellent, you know, and it doesn't always work that way. Right? No, it usually doesn't, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. It, it always, you know, it, it, as mantras of, you know, directors that I like to work with the respect, they always say it's, you know, you know, good scripts are about character and story, you know, character and story. And you have character and story, you know, as you said before, you can, a lot can be forgiven, but character and story is essential to a good script you know um and as as you've said you know the truth is though they're not oh they're not as many out there as there used to be you know like i i i think i've said it before on these podcasts you know my father was a huge lover of movies and when i started making movies and would explain how hard it was to make a movie one time he said to me he goes i get it you tell me how hard it is to make a movie but if that's the case why are there so many shitty movies <laughs> I think that only the best of the best get made like, well because yeah. everyone believes that maybe director can do something with that and make it better than it is but uh, unfortunate unfortunate truth is uh, it's really hard like if you if your script is not there at first point if you're if you 
get like, you know, torched by studio. And I've seen that in my career where very talented people were kind of destroyed by constant, constant pressure because not everyone can handle the pressure. <clears throat> That's the other thing. Uh, very, very few, because right now, if like in old days, you know, you look like, I don't know, Michelangelo Antonioni, the greatest Italian director, you know, he'd been like, very silent, don't talk with people much, you know, like today director has to like entertain, sell the thing, be a strong, take the shit, like happy, happily take the shit, you know? So, so it basically by all this combination uh, and plus it has to be so talented as well. Like it becomes hard. Like it's like just as a, as a human being to be produced, you know what I mean? Made yeah, in the they have to be like, they have to be like a circus performer, you know? <laughs> yeah. You have to have like all the magic tricks and, yeah. then, and still yeah. try to sneak in something, what they really want to make the movie about, you know? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, well, you know, this has been a wonderful discussion and I, I've been, as, as you know, I've been trying to get you you know, to come on and have a discussion with me for a long time. I think because of your international background and how your career has blossomed here in the States and how you've now gone back to Russia to even mm -hmm. find another layer of what you're going to bring to the table. Um, I'm so glad to have had you on here and tell us about, you know, your journey to this place because it is a unique one. And I think it's something that people can understand that everyone's journey is unique and it's a road that we all have to take individually to develop a career. No, absolutely. And I, I think also like what cinematographers have to understand, there are a lot of great DPs, you know, skill level wise, they're great. I mean, and uh, everyone, you know, can be better. Of course, there are some, uh, I would say, like, for example, Bradford, I truly love his work, not, not because he's done such a great career or something, because I saw his early movies. Uh, like, and I, I know what kind of a pressure it is shoot those movies in those 20 days. And he was able to find in those 20 days, the look of the movie, the language of the movie. And I think it's extraordinary because I could have probably find something, but I need 40 days for that or 35. No, and he could have managed it in 20, you know? <laughs> so that's a, that's a big deal, you know? And, um, and, but it's a lot, but unfortunately, every DPS career also depends on how movie is going to make, because you can, sh you can work your ass off, but if the movie, uh, when getting recognition as a as a piece of art, film, you know, as an art, no one gonna notice your work. So so it's more about like uh, just be truthful, don't give up, and keep pushing because once you know that movie will happen. Like for example, when I did Under Watch, I'm not saying it's a, a piece of art or something, but it was a hit. You know, it made a lot of money. We made it for like five million dollars in in <laughs> in New York. Oh, I'm sorry, in LA. And, uh, and basically, I remember w when we talked with the director, he said like, hey, Roman, I want all these POV cameras and I want 5D and I want GoPro. And I was, I was in Russia, I was already doing like big movies with film, cranes, like all this kind of stuff. I was like, Jesus, probably after the movie, I will never gonna work in uh, America again because it's so shit. It's like shitty cameras, <laughs> like it's, it looks horrible. But then at the end, the, it worked for the story and the movie became hit and I, I still, I mean, people is like, dude, and the watch is amazing. So, so yes, like it's a hard discussion. On a certain point as a DP, you always have to fight for the visuals because if you say, hey guys, whatever it means, like let's just make a great movie, then you end up yourself in the worst interiors and with worst light and no one gonna spend even attention on you. But on the other hand, you have to understand that you can fight right now to finish this close up or you can get a coverage for your director, which will make the scene work. And that's the choice you have to make, you know, uh, because you can win all the time everywhere. And basically balancing on those choices, it's another like work because you, you can also, there are a lot of great DPs who is like very, you know, um, strict, like it's only this way, no other way. And sometimes it just doesn't work. You know, you have to be flexible sometimes, you know, yes. Probably the most great ones, like, I don't know about like, uh, you know, the superstars probably they say, hey, this is it. We're going to shoot it only this way and nowhere else. But I always felt personally that, you know, there's movies more than just the visuals. It's movies is more about like a, this, this atmosphere inside this, this, this uh, like a sense inside, you know, so. I don't know. I, I'm st I, I, I'm I'm really not on the point where I can sort of summarize things because I feel like I'm on my fir fir first third of a journey. So hopefully in 10 years, we can meet Dougie one more time and I can tell you what I really think. But right now it's a lot of uh, a lot of sort of a, um, 
just thoughts and uh and the only thing what i can say about if we talk about not cinematography but just movies in general there's nothing more important than script and your actors this is it like if you have those two things you're 70 percent in the rest is about how you make it what's your language do you make it more unique with your language because these days film critics you know very sort of uh picky like they it's not just enough shoot a good movie like you should it has to be movie with a new perspective it has to be movie with a female lead because not many female stories has been told or with people of you know African Americans or you know different racial whatever you know but uh because we don't know much about the world so we have to put it in and in some time in some ways it's, it's great because yes we have to explore that part of society and let them speak and let do their art but at some reason sometimes it gets silly because you have 20 movies in competition and they're all about the same subject you know it's like you know i mean it's a horrible comparison but i remember it was like some movies uh in russian at some point about uh war world war ii at some point it was like 20 movies about world war ii you don't care about world war ii after you watch 20 movies you just said dude it's enough <laughs> like i've seen i've seen all kinds of stories so it's about yes it has to be about all these points and uh, but at the same time, good movie is a good movie. You know, it can be about anything. It can be uh, so. So it's interesting time we're living in. I think it's a lot of a lot of uh, values has been so mixed up right now that it's really hard to sort of. I think the movies which don't really get shouldn't get too much attention, getting a lot of attention, and movies which should get attention don't get any attention. So, but it's my personal taste. I don't know. Maybe I'm completely wrong and kind of. Well, it's a valid point. I mean, there's always been that push and pull between, you know, movies that 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 people should be reacting to versus ones that, you know, the, the ones that people are reacting to. And and you're so right. There is this always this element of copycat storytelling, you know, where it's like all of a sudden it's like, you know, someone's like, oh, yeah, oh, oh the, the movie about, you know, people doing this thing in space. And then all of a sudden there's like three, four movies like about oh, that same thing. It's like, well, <laughs> You know, where, where there hasn't been like a, a sci-fi, you know, good sci-fi movie greenlit in like eight years. And all of a sudden there's so many sci-fi movies coming out. It's just yeah, because the, the thinking is very, you know, uh, and uh, I, I think it's also because in the old days. And again, it's a it's a very like uh, crazy subject to talk about. But, you know, you had those crazy big uh, monster macho alpha male producers who, of course, heard their dark side and it's horrible. But at the same time, they were like locomotive of pushing things. And because they were like, I'm just responsible for that thing, you know? And right now it's more of a conglomerate. It's more like a like an agency for commercials where it's a five voices. And where it's a five voices, it's really hard to bring it something really unique because those five voices will never get on, on, a, on a material which is like 50-50, you know? It's always, oh, this is definitely going to work. But uh, the, the history of cinema shows that actually the most aging material usually becomes, you know, like a moonlight or something where I'm sure what people was like, no, we're never going to shoot this, you know, <laughs> but then the movie comes out, you understand, oh, wow, I've never thought about it, you know, but yeah, it's like, that's, 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 that's the hardest part right now to, to make these kind of stories to be made, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a very good point. Um, and well, listen, th this has been a wonderful discussion and uh, I don't want to take up much more of your time. Don't I want to thank you for coming on and you've, yeah. you know, you've, once again, you've brought another layer of experience um, into the things, you know, the people that discuss the world of cinema in the film roundtable. So I thank you for being my guest today, my friend. Yeah, always a pleasure, Doc, and uh, good luck with everything. I hope we see each other soon. We, we hopefully we will see each other soon. Best of luck on the West Coast. Okay. And just, just keep the dream alive, my friend. Yeah, bye, everybody. And keep dreaming. Keep bye -bye. dreaming. We dream of cinema. Goodbye, everyone.